Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Adam Furmanek, and for the next 60 minutes or so, we are going to talk about remote work, hacking VPNs, networks, and other stuff. We'll have like five different demos, all of them using internet connectivity, so that's a recipe for disaster, so keep your fingers crossed. What we are going to do today is we are going to see how to connect to our corporate networks from outside of the VPN, how to do it efficiently, and how to do it from various fancy places around this planet. So that's the plan, and let's begin. Before we move on, a couple words about me. I'm a software engineer with nearly 15 years of experience now, author of these two interesting books, one about .NET, one about maps. Feel free to take a look at those. Visit my blog at blog.adamfurmanek.po. Drop me a line on email Twitter. And let us begin. So we will have plenty of various technologies today. We are going to see protocols that you are probably familiar with, like SSH or RDP. We are going to use some fancy technology to connect on the CPU level to some other machine using Intel AMT. We are going to use full tunnels, split tunnels, various VPN kinds, and other stuff. So we are going to go through Different scenarios, not all of those scenarios will be applicable to how you work. Obviously, I'm just showing examples how we could work, how we could organize our, uh, our environment, and it's up to you how you take those and adjust to your needs. So the very first idea we would like to solve or we would like to tackle is we would like to fly to Hawaii or anywhere around the planet, wherever you find fancy, but let's call it Hawaii for now. And we don't want to take our corporate laptop with us. So imagine that you all have your corporate machine. That's a laptop you typically take with you uh, to your office or take it with you, you home and whatnot. We don't want to take it with us, right? We want to leave this laptop in our home and then fly away. And still, we would like to do some work while being abroad. That's the idea. So important stuff that we will do instead of taking the corporate laptop is we will take our personal device. So that's a laptop that we'll keep calling Roadrunner. That could be your tablet, iPad, personal notebook, MacOS, whatever you find. Okay? So we take our personal device with us, fly away, and want to do some work. So that is the idea. Like if we were to picture what we are trying to achieve, we have the, our corporate laptop that sits at home. It can connect to our office network via VPN, Cisco Any Connect, WireGuard, whatever else you have. And we have our Roadrunner, which is with us while we fly to Hawaii. Now, the question is what to do in between to do some work and to be able to connect to the corporate network. So before moving on, I would like to stress a couple of stuff. I'm not going to circumvent any legal policies here, not going to break the law, nothing like that. It's up to you whether you can work from Hawaii legally and you need to deal with visas and whatnot. It's up to you whether you can take your laptop with you across the border to some other country. They might not be allowed. I am not telling you to do that. I am showing the technical solutions to do so, but please consult your legal departments, IT departments, and whatever else. Another thingy, before moving on, we are talking about working from some remote place. First and most important stuff, you need to grab this. This is a privacy screen that costs something like 20 US dollars. So you put it on your laptop screen, and this way people standing next to the laptop cannot see you what you have on your on your screen. When we are talking about confidentiality, working from public places, airports, trains, whatever else, this is a must have. Another thing you should be aware of, please be mindful when it comes to CCTV cameras, public places, people that may be trying to overhear what you're saying over the phone, Keep that confidential, right? We do not want to risk anything here. We just want to make this technically doable. Whether you use it, whether you can use it, that's on you. So some other practical considerations before moving on. I'm not going to show you anything crazy or breaking the law or hacking systems per se. However, just keep in mind that as with every corporate laptop, your companies are most likely legally allowed to monitor what you do on those machines. What stuff you install, how you use administrator permissions, what USB thumb drives you plug in, and other stuff like that. They are allowed to do so. They are allowed to monitor. and more often, they do that. So they probably have some stuff installed on your machines, so they may notice what you're doing. So it's not like we are, you know, circumventing stuff. Just keep that in mind. 
OK, better safe than sorry. Let us now move on. The very first thing you may actually want to do before going to Hawaii is asking your company, hey, how can I work from Hawaii? That's going to be the easiest solution. Many times the answer will be just take your corporate laptop with you, which may be not allowed. So then our presentation begins. So let's go. The very first thing we are going to see is how we can technically connect to a machine that stays at home. And there are many protocols to do that, some of them for visual connectivity. Visual connectivity meaning that we can see the screen, UI applications, web browsers, yada yada is obviously RDP and VNC. RDP remote desktop protocol is the way to go. It can work even with half megabit per second of your network connectivity, so it is really good. VNC, on the other hand, it can only forward K and KVM, meaning it can only forward keyboard, video, and mouse. There are extensions to VNC that can, for instance, forward USB devices, microphones, uh, two-factor authentication, smart tokens, whatever, but generally they are not standardized. VNC is useful in some scenarios. We are going to actually see it over this talk, but generally your first solution should be RDP. And RDP works best with Microsoft Windows, it can work with Linux or Mac OS, but is much worse. So generally, very first recommendation is take Windows. It's just better. When it comes to connecting to Linux-based machines, X forwarding can do the work as long as you are in the same data center, meaning that it won't work across global internet. It's generally too slow. But if you can get a jump host next to your Linux box and forward Xs over there, then it's good enough. If you want to have uh, X on steroids, take a look at Xpra. This is pretty nice extension to X that can allow for session, uh, holding your applications between disconnects and reconnects. Generally, it can do some job. Still, RDP is better. When it comes to textual connections, Obviously, SSH, Secure Shell, the way to go. This is the workhorse of the internet connectivity. The very first step we are going to do, actually, is always connect the SSH. If we can get SSH connection through, then thanks to port forwarding, we can do whatever we wish. Windows has another technology that is called PowerShell Remoting, PS Remoting for short. Don't bother. You can configure it. It takes something like 15, 20 different commands to configure it, and it works across the globe with encryption, TLS, VPNs, yada, yada. Don't bother, especially now that SSH is built into Windows, so no point in, in using PS remoting. So the very first thing we are going to do always is we want to use SSH connection. So the idea that we want to configure is we have our corporate laptop that stays at home, and this corporate laptop can connect to our VPN, to, the, to our office, to some target server in the, in the office connection, OK? And we have our Roadrunner with us here in Hawaii. Between us, there is the internet. Now, what we can do with SSH, and I guess most of you already know that, is we can forward ports. So the very first thing we can do with SSH is I can connect to corporate laptop on some well-known 22 port for SSH, and I can specify that, hey, Port 1234 from my local machine should be routed to a machine called target to port 5678. So this way, I can expose a port 1234 on my Roadrunner in Hawaii, and anyone that connects to this port will be transparently routed to this port 5678 in the network office. Okay? That's the idea with local forwarding. The other thing we can do, obviously, is remote forwarding. We can do the opposite. So now I'm saying that use port 1234 from the remote machine, which is our corporate laptop, and forward it to 5678 on my road runner, meaning that anyone connecting from the office to our port 1234 on the computer that stays at home will be transparently routed to the Roadrunner port 5678. These two connections let us basically forward applications both directions, meaning that we can also forward like RDP protocol, um, web server, FTP server, whatever else we need. So that's why we always want to have the SSH connection first. The other thingy that SSH gives us is the thing that is called SOX proxy. SOX proxy is a dynamic forwarding that gives us the ability to forward port 1234 to whatever port we need on the other end. So we can configure this port 1234 to basically have our web browser opened up on the Roadrunner, 
connect to the internet via office networking connection. And this is something that we are actually going to see, this basic demo. So very first thing I'm going to show you is I am connected to the internet from my Roadrunner here. I'm in Portugal, as you can see. And now I'm going to use a kitty, which is fork of putty, which is SSH. Uh, sorry, which is a SSH client for Windows. And as you can see, I am trying to forward, sorry, port 18421 in a dynamic mode. So I'm going to open a dynamic SOX proxy to connect to the internet. So I'm now trying to connect to SSH. Lovely, it worked. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to use an extension that is called Foxy Proxy. Foxy Proxy, great extension for your browsers, Chrome, Firefox, whatever else. And I'm going to instruct it to use this SSH connection I have behind the scenes. If I now hit refresh, you can see I am now in Helsinki, Finland. So this is what we can do. Obviously, Helsinki, Finland is the target computer of my corporate network conceptually. So now I can browse the internet from my office. And that's the idea that we start with. OK, that was the basic stuff. And I guess most of you already know that. So now let us do something trickier and something more interesting. The very first thing is we always want to get this one connection with SSH. Now, I would like to connect to my machine. The problem that we have with our corporate laptop is it has VPN, right? And VPNs, they can work in various different modes. Typically, VPNs are configured either in split tunnel or in full tunnel. This means that when you connect to the VPN from your corporate machine in the full tunnel mode, then this networking will stop receiving any connections from your local network, public internet, anything like that. It's going to kill, it's basically a kill switch that kills everything around your computer. But it can also work in the so-called split tunnel mode. So first we are going to see the split tunnel connectivity, how to work remotely like that, and then we are going to deal with full tunnel mode. So for split tunnel, this is generally a rare setup, but some companies do that. In in this setup, what we have is the machine has basically two connectivities, like two network links. One of them is the public link you have, your local area network, your local internet, uh, or local connection to the internet. The other network link is to your office, corporate office, that you can use to access corporate applications. Okay? So now the idea is, if we have a setup like that, then we can connect to our laptop more or less directly using public IP, if we have uh, such. So the idea would be our corporate laptop connects to the office over VPN, but we have public IP, so we can connect from Hawaii using this way. If we do not have a public IP or we have firewalls along the way, then what we can do is we can use a jump host with SSH connections. So you buy a tiny secure shell machine like $5 a month, with Linux on it, then what you do is you connect from your corporate laptop to this machine, and this machine basically you configure a remote forwarding of the port, right? So this way, this machine exposes a port that you can connect to from your Roadrunner. So you set up SSH connections with one jump host in between, and this way you can connect to your corporate laptop, and bang, you can work from your corporate laptop, connect to your office VPN, and that's it. As simple as that. Now, what we are going to deal with before moving on to when this is not possible, we are going to see how we can our connection a little bit more reliable. Now, a couple of practical considerations. When you have this jump host in between, it's exposed to a public internet. People are going to hack it. If you do have RDP on any of your machines exposed to your public internet, take a look at event log whether you have 20,000 wrong authentication attempts every day. This is what happens daily. So please use strong passwords and configure your firewalls. And also keep an eye on reflection attacks. Those are attacks that someone can use your machine to basically reflect traffic to somewhere else, for instance, using DNS, Active Directory, and other stuff. Generally, please be mindful and keep yourself secure. Now, let's say, OK, we have our connectivity to our corporate laptop. We can do some work. Now I am traveling on a train. I'm going across the country, and things are breaking. My internet breaks all the time. How can I make it better? 
So the problem with internet when you are traveling, whether it's train, bus, coach, whether you're on the move, whether driving by car, whatever else, is that you need to switch between access points. And obviously, in some places, you have 4G, 5G. In some other places, you have very basic 3G connection. But what we can do instead is we can multiply our connections. So the idea is typically we connect with SSH, one connection, to our corporate laptop. But what if we could have from our roadrunner that sits here, we could have multiple links going to the internet. For instance, we could have a conference Wi-Fi and we could have a mobile phone connection that is here and you can see it's connected to this laptop, right? What we can do now is we can use a thing that is called link aggregation. So link aggregation is basically an idea that we have multiple links to the internet. We merge all of them together to use them in parallel. Now, how we route traffic between those links, that depends on the policies. We can, for instance, use round robin to effectively have twice as fast internet. Right? Because we will have two Wi-Fi connections or whatever else, bang, your downloading files can be, you can double the speed. But we can also go with the broadcast policy. And in broadcast policy, what we do is we take every single packet and send it across all the network links we have and then do the du duplication on the other end. So this is what we are going to do. Imagine that our roadrunner sits somewhere on a train to Hawaii and we have uh, three different internet connections, like train Wi-Fi, two mobile phones, whatever else. Actually, the highest I ever used was four, and it's going to be crazy, like you have too many wires. Don't try it, but anyway, it works. What we do next is we take the SSH client, because we always want to pass just one SSH connection. That's our like holy grail. And we use a demultiplexer and multiplexer in between that takes every packet from this SSH client and sends it over three different network, network links to the other end. Then on the other end, we deduplicate those packets and just pass them through the regular SSH server. Okay? That is the idea. Now, let's see that in action. What we are going to do is, I have an application that does exactly that. So let me actually open up this application. What you can see here, it reports actually three different IP addresses. This IP address is for this laptop. We are going to use it in, in a bit. But I have two different connections, one of them being the Wi-Fi of this conference venue. The other connection is going to be, sorry, actually, this is the connection for this laptop. The other connection is the IP address of my USB tethering phone. Lovely. We have this open up in between. What I'd like to do now is let me close old putty. Let me start a new putty. Let me open it up. Sorry, not like this or like this. Uh, yep, that is good. What you can see here is I actually connected over two different connections because I have two links. The third link, which is going through this laptop, it doesn't work, so that's why it reports exceptions. And you can see important stuff. This SSH connection works and is pinging stuff. What I'm going to do now, and now things become crazy, I'm going to go here and I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off. You can see I did turn it off, and this SSH connection is still working. Crazy, huh? Now it goes even worse, because now I need to reconnect to this Wi-Fi. Lovely. I can connect to NDC Porto. You can see it is connecting. And if it doesn't connect, then this old demo goes, goes to there. OK, it worked. And you can actually see that, yes, I connected here to uh, over new link. So you can see this SSH connection is still working correctly, right? Now, I am taking my mobile phone and bang, and I lost this connection, and you can see SSH is still online. So this is what you can do. Now you can travel across the globe with multiple mobile phones and Wi-Fi connections, whatever else, and when only when all of them are dead, just like now, this is the moment where the SSH connection actually dies. Okay, so this is what you can do. The more mobile phones you have with you, the more reliable the connection is. And obviously, let me just reconnect to this Wi-Fi. We're going to use it a little more later. So this is what you can do, and this is how you can increase the reliability of all your connections. Now, when it comes to practical considerations, a couple of statistics, generally, when you use mobile phones, they will typically turn your network connectivity, for instance, to down to 3G. 
So they won't connect to 4G if like the 3G signal is stronger. You can enforce that on Android phones with this short code star-4636 star or something similar, or you can use force LTE application to do that. So generally, you take your mobile phones, you force them to always connect to LTE, 4G, 5G, whatever you have, to not drop the connection down to 3G. Uh, you can't do that with iPhone, unfortunately. So generally, use Windows and use Android. End of product placement for today. Now, when it comes to connections, you can actually see the table at the bottom of the screen. I was traveling from Krakow, which is south of Poland, to the Baltic Sea up north. And for around 600 kilometers, assuming all those network links are of the same quality, we would expect that all of them send and receive the same amount of traffic, right? As you can see here on the screen, one of the network carrier received something like 200 megabytes, whereas the train Wi-Fi wi -Fi received 350. So there is a difference in quality and reliability of your links, but the whole point is that you can increase it when you are in your know, black spot. So that's it, let's carry on. Now, let's say I am on a plane. I was traveling on a train, now it's time to take the plane, and I would like to connect to my machine. And the very, very interesting fear, thing with plane, airport, hotels, etc., etc., is they have those weird Wi-Fi's where you need to open up portal and log in into the network, right? And those portals, sometimes they just don't work, right? Hands up if you ever faced that, right? So many of us, why doesn't it work? It's so simple and still doesn't work, right? But what we can do, in that case, and also what we can do on a plane. On a plane, you very often have a connectivity, network connectivity, which is free, which gives you only the chat applications, like Messenger, WhatsApp, other stuff, right? So they won't let you root your RDP SSH connection. But sometimes those networks are actually super interesting because they let you use ICMP, which is basically ping. So we can use ping to route your TCP connection over ping. And ping actually can achieve even near native speed when it comes to going across the internet. So the idea now is, as always, we have our roadrunner, wide internet in between, and then we use TCP over ICMP client, right? Let's see that in action. So another crazy demo coming in. So what we are going to do now is a, I have an application that is called ping tunnel. And it is connecting to the internet using ping. I can open up my kitty again, and you can see that, bang, it worked. If I now go to my browser, try refreshing, here now we are in Poland. Welcome, hello from Warsaw. So this is what you can do. When this portal in hotel room, in airport, or on a plane doesn't work, just use ping, ICMP, and it works well. Moving on, that was another stuff, but it goes even crazier. TCP over DNS. So there is a DNS server that lets you basically answer, hey, what's the IP address of Google.com? And typically, we use uh, nodes that are called A node or something like C name or whatever else, right? But DNS server has also this TXT node. And TXT node holds a human-friendly text of whatever you put into it. Right? So now what we are going to do is we are building a TCP over DNS connection that uses TXT addresses or TXT nodes in the DNS server, we base 64 the TCP packet and send it across the wire using DNS. This is turbo slow, not even close to routing a decent SSH connection, but still, let's see that in action. So let me close this, let me close this, and let me open up the thingy which is called TCP over DNS. And you can see I am using some magic, for instance, domain u.adamfurmanek.pl, which has pre-configured properly. Let us, let us now try open the connection. And here comes the, yes, it worked. And let's now refresh the page and let's see whether it will load up. So it's taking, oh, actually it took something like four seconds. So you can see it works. So you can do TCP over DNS. And to be honest, uh, never, never had a need to use that. Never expect to use that, but it's a fancy stuff. Okay, so we can connect to our corporate laptop from Hawaii using various different technologies. But now comes a very tricky part. What if it dies? 
What if it installs the you know, Windows updates, your power goes down, whatever else? How can we rescue our machine while being in Hawaii? And there is a thingy that is called Intel Active Management Technology, and I guess most of you, most of your corporate laptops, they have it enabled. Intel AMT is a technology that builds in another operating system directly into your CPU. Whether it's Intel, AMD has its own technology for that, but generally when you have laptop machine just like that one, it actually is running two operating systems, one of them being Windows, the other one is running directly on the CPU and it's based on Minix. And this another distribution is turned on 24-7, even if you turn your machine off. And it monitors everything that goes to your Ethernet connection, as you can see it here. Anything that goes through this Ethernet cable is actually first captured by your CPU operating system and then gets directly routed to your Windows. So what we can do with that is we can use this thingy, which is part of Intel vPro suit, so basically corporate laptops, they do have that, or it's part of the AMD Dash, I think then the name was, and we can use that to actually access the machine below the operating system level, directly on the CPU level. Sometimes it's even called ring minus three. If you know rings zero, one, two, three, then it actually goes the opposite way. If you wanna check it out whether your machine has that enabled, first you can go to Intel documentation and see whether you have Intel V Pro enabled, and you can also, when booting up your machine, you can check whether you have Mebex extension in your BIOS. Mebex, which is Management Engine BIOS extension. If you have that, you can enable that and we can do some magic. So now what we are going to do is, we are going to have a jump host in between, sitting next to our machine at home, and this jump host is connected to our corporate laptop over this old Ethernet connection. Okay, now what we are going to do is we are going to use this connection to connect directly to this machine. Let me open it up and let me start a, some crazy demo. So what I have in here, let me close this stuff. This is not needed. This is not needed. What I have in here is... Is, is, is what? I have this. This is the IP address of my Ethernet network card. So this is 80.5. And I can connect to 80.10 on uh, some well-known port. And this 80.10 is actually this laptop. So I connected to this laptop over a um, HTTP connection. And now I can log in. OK. And there you go, and I can see I'm connected straight to the CPU. I can check stuff like IP addresses, system information, whatever else. But it's not the end of the story. What I can do now is I can use VNC Viewer, and I can connect, and now people in first rows need to confirm that there is a colorful frame on the screen of this, right? This colorful frame here indicates that I connected to this machine over CPU. And you can see that now, I am like shaking this screen, right? And I can even do, oh sorry, IP config, and you can see this is 80.10. So I connected to this stuff over CPU, but we said, okay, what if this thingy dies? Okay, let it die. So I will now try rebooting it, restart, and you can see that this thingy is now turning off. I am still connected over the Ethernet connection. You can see it over there. And now when the screen goes down, I am hammering escape keyword like crazy because I want to enter BIOS. You can see this thingy li lit up. Hopefully it all works. Trembles, trembles, and there is HP logo. And, and there we go. So we can now enter BIOS of this other machine, doing it completely remotely from Hawaii. So I can even enter, and you can see this ME setup. This is management engine, the tricky I am using, okay? So let me actually, what? What I would like to do is, I don't know, I can actually go to something like continue boot. Doesn't matter, so let it actually carry on. So let it load to the screen. You can see Windows, you can see the... UI is a little bit shaky now when we are connecting in this early stage of, of Windows connectivity, but generally we should see the log on screen in a sec and we should be able to, yes, we should be able to log in to this other machine. 
So this is what I did. If your laptop died when installing Windows updates or you need to reinstall Windows, this is how you do. But I can do even more tricky stuff. For instance, I can turn it off. Because previously, you could say, OK, it was still on. It was still working, right? Because I just turned it off and turned it on. So we can see now it's turned off. I do not have any screen over here. All is black because the laptop is turned off. I can turn off the VNC. I can come back to my edge. I can refresh this page. And you can see it's still up and running. And I can go to remote control. And I can send command, turn power on. Sending this command, confirm. And you now see this thing lit up. So I am turning this laptop on, doing everything directly using Intel AMT. So this is what you can do. This is what you can do using Ethernet and using this stuff. And it is like built in into most of your corporate machines. So you feel free, go home and start using that. When it comes to some practical considerations, do not ever expose this over public internet with no password. Better not, because as you can see, this is crazy. Also, I encourage you to take a look at some history of this protocol and some rootkits and other uh, attacks over that, because you could actually you know, break your laptop on the CPU level and, and other stuff. So this is interesting, and that's it. Now, we covered a simple scenario, because we had a split panel. So our machine was directly exposed to the internet. Now things get tricky, because we have a full tunnel. So how do we connect to a machine that drops all the network packets once we connect to VPN? And we could try connecting over public IP. This is not going to work. Why? Because we connected to VPN. And once you connect to VPN and you have this link enabled, everything outside of this VPN is dropped. Local area network, your straight direct traffic to your router, anything coming to you over public IP, that gets dropped. You could use a jump host trick that we used before, but this time the connection won't be going through here, but will go directly through your office, right? Because all your network traffic is going through your corporate network. So it will technically work, but then your network IT administrator may start asking some questions, what is this connection? Not to mention they may actually block your domain names, etc., etc. Funny story, once I was giving a talk in uh, Microsoft Redmond, Microsoft headquarters, and people laughed when I showed my blog address, because blog Adam Furmanek PL was blocked. So generally they couldn't even download the slide. So these things happen. How do we deal in that situation? The very first thing when we think about full tunnels is Intel AMT is going to work. This is worth pointing it out. This connection over this old white cable will work. Why? Because we are connecting directly on the CPU level, way below operating system. So this is going to work. But this uses VNC. And it's kind of not recommended, kind of slow. Okay. So how can we do better? And the very first trick we are going to use is we are going to use SSLH. SSLH, which is very similar in naming to SSL and SSH, is a day multiplexer application that checks your packages and tries to recognize what traffic is sent over a TCP link. So when the very first packet of a connection is a binary packet, then it's most likely TLS handshake. Okay? So SSLH doesn't do a thing. But if it's a textual packet, then it's open SSH connecting. And if it's open SSH connecting, then we can do some magic to it. And the magic looks like this. So imagine that you have your corporate laptop trying to connect to your VPN server over regular network connectivity. We put something here in between on the very first hop. That could be your router. That could be your mobile phone. That could be your whatever. And this thingy has SSLH. And now when it recognizes there is a textual packet going through this link, and this is the very first packet, then we assume it's open SSH connection, so we hijack it. So we hijack it to some other place. So this way we can effectively escape the full tunnel. OK? Let's see that in action. And that's going to be tricky, because for that, I actually need to use a virtual machine, because I didn't want to bring yet another laptop with me. So let's see what we are doing. So I have two virtual machines, and I have uh, a some host. So some host, you can see, is in Germany. 
So I have DNS leak reporting my IP address over here. And if I go to ipconfig, you can see that I have my public IP address, which is 58 something. Oh, snap, this internet connection is slow. And then I have another IP address, which is 192.168.100.1 which is basically local networking for my virtual machines. Now I have a virtual machine with Linux, and on this Linux stuff, I have 100.10 connection, which goes to the host of this, uh, of this whole setup, and I have 200.1, another IP address, that is used as a NAT server by this Windows running here on the side. So here on the side, you can see I have I have 200.2, okay? So what you can see now is I have my network connectivity and I'm connected directly from the same IP address, right? Because it's using the same network connection and I can also connect to this IP via RDP client using this IP address. So you can see all works. Now what I'm going to do is I am turning my VPN on. So I will connect to some VPN. I will need to adjust my DNS uh, server. I can refresh the page bank. I'm in different place now. I connected to a VPN and it's a full tunnel VPN. If I now try connecting to this machine using RDP, you can see bank connection doesn't go through because it's a full tunnel VPN. So this is our starting setup. What we now want to do is I am going to configure SSLH. So this is what I'm going to run. SSLH is exposed as Docker, where I specify that, hey, look at all the connections going to the port 443 and check if this connection is a, uh, this part, if this connection is a uh, binary connection, then pass it through to the IP address, which is the same as you can see on the right side of the screen, so to the VPN server. But if this connection is a textual connection, then pass it on to 100.1. And 100.1 is the host of this whole setup, this Windows machine. Let me start it now. Lovely. Now what I need to adjust is the routing table. So I say, hey, everything that comes on port 443, pass it through my local stack so it goes to SSLH. And now I can even show you the IP addresses. And I should have the routing over here. Let's refresh. Seems like internet is still working. And what I can do now is I can connect to the IP address of my VPN server over port 443. And I'm going to remote forward port 8533 to this machine. So if I now try connecting to that, it asks me for a password. And if I now open it up, you can see it did connect to SSH on port 443, which is typical TLA port. Why? Because this connection is now hijacked and extracted of the VPN and moved on to this local machine. So if I now try connecting to this, you can see it replied asking for some, some, um, some uh, domain name, uh, asking for certificates going to this machine. So this is what we can do to escape the tunnel. So on this diagram, what we did is I ran this Docker in between, and whenever a connection goes through and we recognize this is a textual connection, I just get it out of this VPN. And no network administrator can figure that out that you're doing that unless they really check every single TCP connection you have running on your machine, right? Because apart from that, it's completely transparent to the network connectivity. Moving on, so this is what we did with SSLH. But now let's make things a little bit trickier because we are lazy. Why do I even need to use my corporate laptop, right? It's heavy, it's sturdy, it has all those VPNs. Can I somehow take my corporate machine and ditch it altogether? The answer is there is a fantastic application that is called Disk to VHD. It's provided by Microsoft. So what happens now is you take your Disk to VHD application, you run it on your corporate laptop, and it creates a virtual hard drive of your whole machine. You can then take this virtual hard drive that is VHD file compatible with Hyper-V, with VirtualBox, with VMware, with whatever, and you can use it somewhere else. So you could take it with you to Hawaii if you want it. So this is what we can do. We can take that, that machine, turn it into a virtual disk, and then boot this disk using either native boot or using virtualization or whatever else. 
Technical remark here when you do that, mind that if you do native boot then or other stuff, you may not be able to run BitLocker or you may not be able to encrypt your machine. Meaning that if you do this stuff, generally don't put this virtual drive somewhere on the internet because you shouldn't trust your infrastructure providers. But in technicality, you can take this virtual machine and turn your corporate laptop into a virtual machine that you host on Azure, EC2, or wherever you wish, okay? And once you host it on Azure, bang, it's on public internet so you can connect to it, obviously. Now, how do we connect to it? Because it still has the full tunnel VPN, right? So once we connect to it, we won't be able to dial in using regular public IP address. Generally, whenever you connect to a virtual machine, your hypervisor provides you with a thing that is called KVM, keyboard visual mouse. So this lets you connect to the machine even if it doesn't have the network stack, right? You may have noticed that if you ever used Hyper-V, you can connect to, to your machine like even if it has no connectivity or whatever. This works because this is actually technically inserting network packets straight directly into the machine, okay? But it works even if you have full tunnel VPN. So now you can turn your virtual machine on, connect to the VPN, and connect using this KVM and do this magic, and you can just work like that. The problem with this approach, though, it's not RDP. So you can't root USB devices, you can't root RD, uh, microphone and other stuff. VirtualBox, for instance, can handle that. Hyper-V uses regular IDP, RDP protocol to do that, so we can't necessarily root SSH connection and other stuff. How can we deal with that? TCP over file system. So we routed TCP over ICMP, which was ping. We routed it over uh, DNS. People on the internet routed over S3 buckets. What we are going to do now is a little bit easier. We are just going to route it over file system. So conceptually, what we are going to do now is we have a laptop that has a shared directory with the host, and we can write down to this shared directory and read it back up from our host. So this is how we can route the TCP connection in between. So let's see that in action. Hopefully all works. Let me turn this off. Let me turn this off. I don't need that. I am still connected to a full tunnel VPN over here. But you can see that I do have some Shared drive over here, you can recognize this is TS client over there, right? So this is shared with the host. I can start TCP over file system server. I can start TCP over file system client. And now I can try connecting to this stuff. So if I connect my putty, you can see this thingy is loading in, and there we go. It connected. We can even go to those directories, and we can see, bang, this is like a raw content of the connection being written down to a drive. What I can do now is I can go back to my Firefox. I can open up a new container with with a foxy proxy behind the scenes. I can try DNS leak, and there you go. I now have the connectivity through this virtual machine using TCP over file system. So this way we can once again escape the full tunnel with virtual machines. But this is not the end of the world on the end of the things we have today. Uh, we can also use TCP over IPC. So if you don't like using files, then every computer has a thing that we stopped using a, like years ago, which is called serial port, right? But now, IPC and serial ports are used by virtual machines to basically provide the connectivity like serial port that is exposed to the host. So you can do TCP over file system or TCP over IPC using the same way, and you can even figure out how to configure the bot connectivity, etc., etc., the way we did 40 years ago, and connect to this virtual machine. So in summary, depending on what your setup is, if you have split tunnel, then you can use obviously Intel AMT because it works on the CPU level. You can connect directly over public IP or use jump host or whatever else. And the recommendation is just use jump host and use Intel AMT. And this gives you, protects you from like your machine going down and you can connect from Hawaii. When you have full tunnel, you can still use Intel AMT, but SSA jump host will go through the 
uh, your corporate network, okay? So generally, use SSLH and AMT as backup where possible. With virtual machine, you can also use TCP over file system and other stuff, obviously. Generally, again, use SSLH and your KVM provided by hypervisor. And this way, you can connect from basically wherever you wish and even answer questions like, does it require root permissions? Can it be even found out by, uh, or recognized by the network IT administrator? Does it support RDP protocol, microphone, other stuff? So this is what you do. At the very end of this slide deck, there is a QR code. You can download the slide deck with all those things. So feel free to, to do that. Generally, recommendation is jump host, SSLH, and Intel AMT if you can. Lovely. That being said, can I do VPN over VPN? Now, because now, consider this scenario. You typically work from the office, or you used to work from the office, right? And sometimes your client expects you to use another VPN just because you need to connect to some far remote uh, location or whatever. And this VPN uses full tunnel. And for instance, it may be exposed only on the allow listed IP addresses, right? So you have locations A and B, and only location A can connect to this VPN. Now you go home. And in, at home, you would like to connect to your client's facility, but the problem is you would need to have IP address of your location A, right? So you need a full tunnel VPN to location A. But then you would need to have another full tunnel VPN to connect to location, location B. If you ever tried putting two full tunnel VPNs side by side, mm, not going to work. They're going to fight each other and going to turn it off. How can we deal with that? And the solution to that is more virtual machines, as with everything in computer science, right? Let's put another layer of indirection. What we are going to do now is we are going to use two different things. First, we can use routers with VPN connection. So we take our, there are actually two solutions on this slide. First solution, you have a corporate laptop that connects to your some office location A using a router with VPN enabled. So then all the traffic goes through your router and is going through the VPN connection. And then from your corporate laptop, you enable another VPN connection that is translated or transported transparently over that. But you can also go with multiple virtual machines. So you can have one big box on which you run a first virtual machine and this virtual machine uses VPN to your location A. And then on this virtual machine, you host another virtual machine that has a VPN to your location B. And this connection goes effectively through the VPN connection of the external virtual machine. So you have VPN over VPN. And this way, obviously, your host can use TCP over file system or SSLH or other stuff to jump into this VPN or jump out of this VPN. This is how you can do this stuff. Now, the question you might ask is, can I carry on with that? And the answer is, you can actually, I managed to run four layer of virtual machines. Virtual machine, in virtual machine, in virtual machine, in virtual machine. So that's technically what you can do. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, though it's super slow, but technically it works. Lovely. Now, we connected to our laptop, but let us now ask a couple other things. How do I actually do a video conversation, right? How do I do a teleconference from Hawaii? And the problem with RDP is that RDP is terrible in routing microphone and audio because it re-encrypts it again, okay? So if you try using your RDP connection to speak over microphone, that's not going to work. You can expect something like easily half a second of delay, sometimes even longer. Put that into Hawaii and also use TCP over file system. Not a chance. So what we can typically do instead is use browser. So you take your Roadrunner and you open up Firefox or Chrome on this machine and you connect to your beloved Teams, Google Meet, Zoom or whatever else from your browser. And all those instant messengers, they generally work this way. Just keep in mind a couple of stuff. First is, you need to be aware of geolocation. For instance, Teams may block you if you try connecting from some remote location. 
Okay, so for that you want to use Foxy Proxy to route the traffic through the place you need. Another stuff is your location may also be leaked by your browser API because now browser can tell where it is. So this can also be reported to Microsoft and teams will block you. For instance, some of my machines were actually blocked in Google and I couldn't even use Google.com just because they thought I'm a hacker because I used some shell that was also used by others to do some crazy stuff. So generally always use proper proxies and mind what IP address you have. When it comes to browsers, I generally love Firefox with multi-account containers. This is fantastic. The problem is Firefox does not necessarily support all the, uh, all the um, uh, communication platforms. For instance, Hado is a bit weird. Uh, Messenger sometimes doesn't work generally like that. So Firefox may not necessarily be the best choice. You can go with Chrome and have multiple profiles. So you have private profile and your work profile. You can also use a fork of Chromium, which is called Send Browser, which gives you like multi-logon tabs in one application, similarly to Firefox multi-account container. Moving on, when it comes to screen sharing, how do you share the screen? And I highly recommend you never share the screen from your Roadrunner, just because you probably have your private stuff on your private laptop, right? What you want to do is you want to connect to the same meeting from two places from your Roadrunner and from the corporate laptop that stays at home. And you share the screen directly from your corporate laptop, but you give a mi microphone and audio from your Roadrunner. The problem with this approach is some communicators will show that you connected from two places. So people may ask, hey, why do I see you twice on the contact list, right? Some applications may not let you in to log in twice. So you will need to connect once anonymously, once as logged in. There may be some other quirks, so generally check that out before traveling. You can also join using GSM. So instead of connecting via like application, you can dial in on a special free, free number and call it over phone. Keep in mind, this may expose your phone number. This may also be super expensive because you are calling some international number. And also, this will be slower and will result in worse audio quality. So you may try to avoid that if possible. You can also use voice over IP. Nothing stops you from having like Google Voice and connecting to this phone number from Google Voice, which goes over the internet. Uh, GSM also is not encrypted. Yet another thingy, do not use it when you can avoid because it's not encrypted and people may listen to what you're saying. So this is a um, confidentiality issue. Another thingy, VPN and geolocation, we covered that and we have only a couple more minutes left so I'll need to speed it up. Generally with VPNs and geolocation, always mind how your IP is reported because your IP may be reported incorrectly by various providers. For instance, your Google may think that you are here in Portugal, but Microsoft may think you are in France. There are IP addresses that work like that. So if you take just a off-the-shelf SSH uh, server from the internet, you may have weird IP uh, geolocation reported by the services. <clears throat> when it comes to connecting from mobile phone, let's say that we would like to take a meeting and go for a walk or whatever. How do I do the magic and how do I connect to the meeting from my mobile phone? Generally, the same way as we did with our laptops, right? You can run Firefox or Chrome on your uh, mobile phone. You can use RDP and connect to your corporate laptop from your mobile phone if needed. This generally all works. If you are in a meeting when doing it from the phone, you may also take a look at call barring or call forwarding. This is the carrier option that you basically ask your network provider to not dial in any calls to your phone. So when you are having a meeting over Teams, no one can actually call you on the phone and kick you out from the meeting, uh, Teams meeting. So this is a very nice, very nice thingy. Uh, this is a summary of how you can actually experiment with RDP and microphone. So I even tried doing something like multi-level RDP, and I got something like two plus seconds of the delay. So generally, routing microphone over RDP doesn't work. Routing microphone over browser may be a little bit tricky. Generally, native applications on your mobile phone is the best solution, but then you need to have VPNs and other stuff. But there are many other ways you can, you can do that. Another thing, just to quickly run through what else we need. Before going to Hawaii, take your two-factor authentication. If you don't test it out before leaving your home, you are screwed. 
Because in Hawaii, you won't reconfigure that, okay? So take your two-factor authentication with you. UB keys, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, whatever else you use, make sure it works, make sure you can use it over RDP, and make sure you have backup solutions for that. When you cannot attend a meeting for whatever reason, just because you are taking a plane to Hawaii, you can always record a meeting. Just ask your teammates whether they agree to that. Most of the platforms, they support recording the meetings native, Teams, Google Meet, yada, yada. You can always set up OBS on your corporate laptop and just record the meeting when you dial in. Obviously, ask for permissions. Make sure you're legal when it comes to this. When you work remotely and you need a whiteboard because you work as an architect, system designer, or whatever, what can you do? Generally, there are two things. First of them is get yourself a laptop that has a touch screen and then open up this tricky, magical, super crazy application that is called Microsoft Paint. And now you can, you can, you can, why can't I? That is tricky, why does it work? What happened with, uh, with my laptop? Or maybe, oh, now it's better? No, it's not. Okay, apparently my touch screen died, so get yourself a backup. <laughs> but anyway, get yourself a laptop with a touch screen. And actually, this is also super useful where you, when you work from home. Get yourself something like this, 12 inch touch screen, which costs something like 100 US dollars. Just put it on your side, mirror your main screen on it. So whenever you need to draw while being on a call, just start Microsoft Paint and do the drawing on this side screen. Super useful when you are doing architectural work. You don't need any applications like Draw.io, Miro, other stuff like that. Microsoft Paint. Carry on. If you are working remotely and you don't feel like sitting the whole day, obviously what they told you is get yourself a standing desk, get yourself a good orthopedic chair, but I'm telling you now get yourself a treadmill. So you can actually take a treadmill and walk when you are working. If you can't walk outside because like, you need to do some coding, then get yourself a treadmill and you can easily walk like five miles a day on this. Super healthy, super useful, highly recommend that. So, you don't need to sit all day or stay in your bed if you want to. If you need more screens because you are like traveling or whatever, generally there is a very nice thing that it, this USB adapter that gives you additional screens. So actually this laptop can handle something like six different full HD 4K screens by plugging in those USB adapters. Sorry to say that your Mac doesn't cut. Oh, I said end of product placement, sorry. Uh, so get yourself those and you can do all of that magic and get something like even six screens if you wish. I guess your office can't deal with that. And I need to charge. Last thing that you may need to, uh, to be aware of, most of your laptops can now be charged via USB-C. And you can also get a power bank for your laptop. So if the power bank is strong enough, you can actually have a power bank charging your laptop, so you don't need electrical charge, like a socket plug for whatever, for easily like two or three days. So this is what you can do. Cookbook, just to wrap it up. Get yourself a dedicated server. And I, as I said in the beginning, I just showed you many different solutions. Take those and adjust to your needs, OK? So what you can do is get yourself a server located in a country of your choice where you can use it as a jump host with SSH connectivity. Turn your corporate laptop into virtual machine if you want. Configure SSLH, TCP over file system, TCP over ICMP over DNS over whatever you need. Configure your VPNs and proxies. Make sure you have two-factor authentication. Make sure you have microphones prepared. Get some local phone number in case of you need to work from while being on the move. Get lots of data. Take your privacy screen with you. Do not speak loudly in public places. Mind your surroundings. Be considerate and don't do tricky stuff. And ultimately, fly to Hawaii. If you happen to have any questions, now it's the right time to ask them. And this is the QR code pointing to the slide deck so you can get all of that I showed you today. Any questions? Thank you. OK, I don't see questions. Uh, so feel free to ask them offline. Uh, I will be around, so feel free to reach out. Oh, there is one, yes. Is there, is, is there a corporate laptop that doesn't have BitLocker on it? 
I wouldn't say that's a usual practice. Most corporate laptops, they are encrypted. They have BitLocker on them, yes. Yeah. No, it will work. Uh, that's the question regarding uh, disk to VHD. You can clone even BitLocker-enabled drive because this works from the Windows operating system. So it knows how to do that. Yeah, and in worst case, you can always turn off BitLocker for an hour, clone it, and turn it back on, right? Because mostly it's set up using TPM, which is directly there in your hardware. So it's not a big deal. Uh, any other questions? There was another one. I was just uh, wondering the um, Intel AMC connection thing that you can use to connect through the CPU. Uh, that works uh, for BitLocker encrypted uh, computers as well. Uh, the question is whether Intel AMT works for BitLocker encrypted computers. I actually didn't try it with BitLocker, but it should work. Uh, sorry, I take that back. Yes, it does work with BitLocker computers. One of my computers had BitLocker. Yes, hmm. it works. It connects directly on the CPU, so CPU will do whatever you need, and it's not using anything from your operating system, right? So the only thing that BitLocker would, bra would break here is if you had your machine turned off and wanted to read something from the drive without having Windows boot on, right? But you can always boot your Windows and have it decrypted and, and whatnot, so it works well. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, that's another question. What's the password? One, two, three, four, obviously, right? <laughs> I had to remember it. <laughs> Any other questions? No other? There is one. So you talk a lot about using VMs. Do you consider using Docker containers to substitute a lot of this? Because a lot of the work you're showing could probably be done with the Docker container to facilitate. I know the, the two-way, uh, the two-layer uh, full tunnel VPN you can do to a, to a point with Docker as well. I've tried it and it kind of works. It's not amazing sometimes, but yep. have you considered it? Because yeah. it's much easier to set up. That's a very good question whether we can replace uh, virtual machines with Dockers. Uh, technically, yes, you can, obviously. I didn't use that, and generally, I don't think that would work in all cases because sometimes you use some really nasty VPNs provided by some of your clients that won't work in Docker and Linux. That's the thing, right? If you can run your VPN in Docker, much easier, much more lightweight, right? But he, like what I was doing is I wanted to show that any VPN can be done this way, and that's why the virtual machine would, would do better. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Doesn't seem so. If you happen to have any questions, feel free to... Uh, to reach out after this talk and being all of that set couple of links for you. So if you wanted to read more, links to my blog, links to the internet where you can download those files, those things, applications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And being all of that said, I'd like to thank you for attending this talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.